Looks like everyone did. All right, we're ready to start. Let's just pray briefly. Father in heaven, guide our minds. Help us to be able to clearly understand your will for our lives today. I ask in Jesus' name, amen. Now in this first presentation this afternoon, I am not going to give you any Bible text to look up. We'll do that later. But this first presentation is going to be simply an identification presentation in which you're going to identify different aspects of the gospel. Here's the real question. In Seventh-day Adventism, what is it that makes Adventism so unique, so special, that you really need to have this church planted in this Washington, D.C. area a few years ago? Why bother? Why should we hold evangelistic meetings? Why should we give Bible studies? What makes Adventism totally unique and special? And you say, it's the Sabbath, of course. Well, no, it isn't. I am just going to guess that in an area like this, Washington, D.C., general area, you could probably visit a different church regularly on every Sabbath day and never darken the doors of a Seventh-day Adventist church. There are other Sabbath-keeping churches around that you could keep the Sabbath for the rest of your lives. And you run down our other doctrines, state of man and death, second coming of Christ. We're not unique in those teachings. We've borrowed them from others, and we're very glad that others came up with that knowledge before we did. So what makes Adventism unique? And right now you may think this is very strange for me to say. I believe what makes Adventism totally different from any other Christian teaching is its understanding of how we are saved by the life and death of Jesus Christ. And you say, wait a minute, wait a minute. When I turn on my radio or television on any given Sunday morning, what is the preacher most likely going to be talking about? How to be saved by the life and death of Jesus Christ. How can that possibly be what makes Adventism really unique and really different? That's going to be our little study as we introduce this subject this first period this afternoon. We're going to look at two different Gospels. You have two Gospel trees. Two ways of understanding how the Gospel works. And all I'm going to do this afternoon in this first period is to try to identify. We're going to look at the one that looks like that on the left-hand side of your page. I'm going to do the same thing up here, but, you'll, but you have it right in front of you where it's easy for you to see. In this understanding of the gospel, the bottom line is its understanding of sin. Because that's the problem. We're sinners. We're condemned. We're lost. Well, why are we lost? This gospel says it's not because of what you say. It's not because of what you do. It's not even because of what you think. It's because of who you are. And who are you? You are a fallen son and daughter of Adam and Eve. And Adam and Eve, when they sinned, not only turned this world upside down, so we have all the disasters that we know about, but they turned our natures inside out so that instead of being loving and kind and generous and helpful, we are selfish and proud and arrogant and mean by nature. Our natures are not our friends. Our natures are not on our sides. They're not help it's not helping us. And this gospel says that our nature is so bad that the only thing you have to do to get yourself on the road to hell is to draw your first breath. And from that moment on, you're a condemned, lost sinner. I'm going to be sharing some statements as we go along this afternoon from people who believe in one or the other of these two Gospels. Now, I want you to understand one thing as I share these statements. Every one of the statements that I am going to read on both sides of this, these Gospel trees are from Seventh-day Adventists. Every statement from a pastor, a teacher, perhaps a layperson, every statement. Here's the first one. A baby is born a sinner before it has ever committed one sinful act. A baby is born a sinner 
before it has ever committed one sinful act. Now, what does that mean precisely? Here's another statement. This sinful state means that if a baby dies a few hours after birth, he or she is subject to the second death, even though he or she has never broken any commandment. So that baby, as innocent as it looks, is subject to the second death, according to this teaching. You've heard the statement many times, we're born sinners. That's where it comes from. All right, now if that is true, then the next statement is obviously true. Jesus Christ, if he is going to be my Savior, if he is going to deliver me from sin, can he be a sinner? Well, of course not. So that means that if having a fallen nature makes me a sinner, then Christ obviously can't have a fallen nature. We don't even have to open the Bible to understand that. It's just obvious that Jesus Christ can't have my nature. He has to have Adam's perfect nature, and then he can be a sinless Savior. Now these two points are so basic to the rest of the gospel that I'm describing right now that I want to go back over them and just make sure we understand what they're saying. Here's a baby, just born, with a fallen nature, condemned, lost. That baby growing up accepts Jesus Christ as his or her Savior. And at that moment, that baby is forgiven of that condemnation, that sin that he has had from birth. Now remember one thing. In the waters of baptism, your old nature, your fallen nature, the nature you are born with does not go away. It is just superseded and controlled by the Holy Spirit. But you've still got that nature. I don't think I have to tell any of you that. You already know that. So you still are sinning by nature. Even after you've been born again, even after you've been a Christian for 30 years, you're still sinning by nature constantly. But here's the nice part of it. You have been forgiven for that sin constantly. So constant sin is balanced by constant forgiveness in this understanding. But now we come up to a little problem. According to what we have always taught as Seventh-day Adventists, there is coming a time known as the close of human probation, when Jesus steps out of the heavenly sanctuary and ceases his work of forgiving sinners. So now what happens? There is no, and I mean no, evidence in the Scripture or any inspired writing that we're going to lose our fallen nature at the close of human probation. We get to keep that nature a while longer. When does it go away? When will we no longer be plagued by this fallen nature? When Jesus comes. So now watch what's happening. A baby is born under condemnation because of a fallen nature. Accepting Jesus, that child, that adult now, is being forgiven constantly for a constant sin of nature. After the close of probation, according to this gospel, we will still be sinning by nature and still need forgiveness as much as we ever did before the close of probation because our natures don't change until the second coming of Jesus Christ. So in this gospel, there can be no close of probation because Jesus has to continue forgiving us until the moment he comes again. So that is the basic teaching of this gospel. Sin is as constant as breathing for as long as you live or until Jesus comes. Now the second point, Christ's nature. It really isn't about his nature. It's about how he was tempted. Adam and Eve, how were they tempted? Could Satan like make life miserable for them and hound them around the garden? The rules were very simple, weren't they? One tree just one tree in the whole garden, no, the whole world, where Satan could access the minds of Adam and Eve. Would you like that arrangement? Out our way in California, we have some marvelous redwood trees. They think they found the tallest of them all. What if that were the only tree that Satan could access our minds at in this whole world? Folks, just stay right over here. Don't buy a plane ticket anytime soon to California. That's the rule in the Garden of Eden. Hindsight is so good, I would have loved to have been able to tell Adam and Eve, you know, the first job you should do before you get out there and do any real work in the garden is to build a wall around that one tree. You see that tree over there? 
Just build it high. Don't put any doors. Don't put any windows in it. And you will be safe for the rest of eternity. Well, things changed after the fall, didn't they? Now where can Satan access you and me and our minds? At a tree somewhere? Or from within our nature? I used to tell my students, I really don't need a devil to tempt me. I do a good job all by myself. Because now Satan accesses through my fallen nature, my decision-making. And so now I am tempted from within as well as from without, not just once or once in a while, but constantly. So which way was it for Jesus Christ? Was he tempted like Adam, or was he tempted like you and me? And this gospel says like Adam. In fact, one particular individual says Christ was tempted three times in his life. First of all, in the wilderness, second, in the Garden of Gethsemane, and third, on the cross of Calvary. And the unique thing about all of those is he went out there to find temptation, just like Adam and Eve went over there to find temptation. He was not tempted on an individual basis on eating or dressing or temper or discouragement. He was tempted on the big issues. Would he go on with his mission? Would he do what his father told him to do? And he did it only out there where he did battle with Satan, not at home in Nazareth. So those are the two major stepping stones of this gospel that we need to understand clearly. Now we come up to where the rubber begins to hit the road. Justification is just a big word for forgiveness. But you please take careful note that only the word justification is on this gospel tree. Sanctification is not there, and I'm going to tell you why. Justification is 100% Christ's work. Sanctification is a work done by us, aided by the indwelling Christ. Okay. Is a work done by us worth very much in salvation? If sanctification is a work done by us with a little help from Christ, then you rule that out of the saving process immediately. You want what Christ does, not what we do. And so in this gospel, justification is the primary issue. Let's uh, see what that means in terms of practical realities. Let's say you've been a Christian and a Seventh-day Adventist for a year or two. But times are tough economically. And finally you decide one day that you're not getting your family fed and clothed. And the only way you can possibly do that is to reopen your business on Sabbath. And so you do so. And you keep it open on a regular basis. Question, does that reneging on your commitment to keep the seventh-day Sabbath in any way jeopardize your salvation? All right, now, in this gospel, I'm going to read you a couple of statements. I do not believe that you have to keep the Sabbath in order to be saved. This is not Adventist theology. Here's another one from a pastor that uh, you would know if I gave him your name, not a long way from here. Since right behavior is never the ground of our acceptance with God. Now, is that statement correct? It sure is. Right behavior, right eating, right doing is not the ground of our acceptance with God. Since that is true, he says, wrong behavior cannot keep a person out of heaven. Follow that. Since right behavior won't get you into heaven, wrong behavior won't keep you out of heaven. One is not lost by not keeping the Sabbath or giving up the Sabbath. One is saved because one chooses to enter into a saving relationship with Jesus. The only way to lose that salvation is if a person chooses to reject that saving relationship. See, this is a very simple gospel. There is one way into salvation, except Jesus as your Savior. Once you are in salvation, the only way you can lose your salvation is by turning your back on Jesus Christ and saying, I don't want you in my life anymore. I'm going my own way. That's the only way. Sabbath breaking, you're still in. Withholding tithe, you're still in. 
adultery, you're still in. Because those are sanctification issues. And sanctification is not a part of this gospel. It is only a fruit of the gospel. Only a result. Something nice that comes along, but not crucial to the process. And so that's the practical meaning of justification alone. Justification, forgiveness, salvation, end of discussion. Now if that's true then obviously the last part of this little gospel tree is also true. There will be no possible talk of perfection in this life. That has to wait until Jesus comes. And a pastor of one of the largest churches in the Seventh-day Adventist church recently said this, Ellen G. White does not support sinless obedience. Sin is a power in human nature which will not be overcome until the second coming. Belief in sinlessness leads to despair or pride. And so when Jesus says in Matthew 5, 48, be ye therefore perfect, he means loving as I love, not living as I live, because that's impossible. So there is a very clear point in this gospel that perfection of character cannot be allowed or achieved until Jesus comes, when your fallen nature is taken away from you. That's the gospel, as believed by most Christians throughout the Christian world. This is orthodox Christianity. This is the gospel of mainstream Christians, those people that respond to the great altar calls that Billy Graham and others have made in past years that come streaming down to the front and get on their knees before the Lord. This is the gospel they are responding to. This is the gospel proclaimed throughout the Christian churches today. Now this gospel, as you've already seen, is creeping into the Seventh-day Adventist churches. And so now we're going to look at some fruits in this particular gospel tree. The judgment. We believe it began in 1844. But here's a question. You thought that was taken care of when Desmond Ford is off the scene? Here's a recent publication. Does the Seventh-day Adventist doctrine of the cleansing of the sanctuary and the investigative judgment distort, undermine, or contradict the one and only New Covenant gospel of grace? Does the judgment contradict the gospel? And his answer is yes, it does. You can believe in one or the other, but you cannot believe in both. And so questions have arisen down the line about the judgment. What about Ellen G. White in the spirit of prophecy? I'm going to share with you a letter that Adventist parents wrote to Andrews University. Here's how it started. How do we keep our teenagers in touch with Christ? Good question, right? How do we keep our teenagers in touch with Christ? For starters, Deep Six, that means get rid of, messages to young people and all other compilations, there is not a shred of gospel in the lot. Number two, stop publishing Steps to Christ, which is simply another works approach to salvation. My friends, does that surprise you just a little bit? Shock you a little bit? That's Steps to Christ, folks. That's not great controversy. There are some folks who think great controversy is a little strong. But Steps to Christ? I'm going to take you back to the year 1950 to a year when a gentleman that later came in contact with Seventh-day Adventists by the name of Barnhouse uh, first got a copy of the book Steps to Christ from someone. And he was the editor of a magazine called Eternity Magazine, and he wrote this review of Steps to Christ in his magazine. He said, the book is false in all its parts. It bears the mark of the counterfeit from the first page. It contains satanic error. That's a strong <laughs> review of a simple little book on how you can have a relationship with Christ. Why? Because this gospel and that little book are 180 degrees apart. When you read in Steps to Christ about words like surrender and commitment and even a dreaded word called obedience, that just blows this gospel away because that's not part of this gospel. Just accept Jesus as your Savior. Believe he has died for you. Have a prayer relationship with him. Study your Bible. And forgiveness is yours. 
these other words, oh, they're too legalistic. They are not part of the gospel. And apparently that's what happened. Our Adventist parents came to believe that this is true, that steps to Christ is too much works-oriented. Came across another person who said, her writings can still be of great devotional benefit today, but they offer the modern reader no inspired revelation concerning history or health or any topic about which we can know more than she. No information about which we can know more than she. Question marks regarding Ellen White and her writings. The law, Seventh-day Adventists have always said that the law was not made the cross, that it is valid for us today, and we should be obedient to that law. But then again, you come back to that first point. If we are sinning constantly because of our nature, I read in the Bible that sin is the transgression of what? The law. That means we're breaking the law constantly. How can we possibly say that the law is good for us and can be obeyed when every one of us is breaking the law 100% of the time? And the Sabbath? This Sabbath day that we're keeping right now, unless you parked your natures out in your cars, you're breaking the Sabbath right now by your nature within you. So how can we possibly talk about the Sabbath as being vital at the end of time? Up to the top of the tree. Health. We've been talking about health. We'll be talking a lot more about health. Health is obviously a sanctification issue. And remember, sanctification is not a salvation issue. It's only a result of salvation. It only comes after you have been saved. So why should we make such an issue of it? Why should we make such an, a, a point of being careful about our health? After all, it's an option. If it helps you, fine, but don't worry about it for salvation purposes. It will not make any difference. We're going to share a couple of statements with you on this point. God's salvation is so extravagant, so comprehensive, that it can't be increased or diminished by what we eat, drink, or wear. Exercise and a good diet contribute to a long and useful life, but they don't add to our salvation. So, nice to have around, good principles, but not for salvation. Another one. Members give assent to various standards and rules as a condition of membership in the organization. We need to keep in mind that this assent is not related to their salvation, only to being a member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Now think about that with me just a little bit. We tell people, if they want to become Seventh-day Adventists, that they really should not be smoking and drinking. Why do we do that? Well, it's because one of, it's one of the rules of the church. A church is an organization that has rules. Companies have rules about how you dress. If you want to be a part of the group, you, you subscribe to those rules. Card-carrying member, put your name there. I won't smoke or drink. But remember, it has nothing to do with your salvation. It's just being a member of the church. Though I believe something to be correct from a religious perspective, it is not a matter of salvation. Have you been hearing that a lot? This isn't a matter of salvation. This really isn't that vital to whether we're saved or lost. And that's where this comes from. So those are some of the reasons. Now when we come to the area of standards, now I'm talking about all the standards now. What we watch, what we listen to, what we read, what entertainment we participate in, and yes, even the clothes we wear. All of those standards, they are clearly, clearly sanctification issues, not justification issues. So why again make such a fuss minor, uh, majoring in minors? Don't worry about them. Let everyone find their own way. The Lord will save us as he promised by forgiving our sins. Some of the impacts that this gospel has made upon the Seventh-day Adventist church in doctrine and lifestyle. Now, please go back way down to the bottom of the tree. It says predestination down there. Why is that under the tree? Because when this gospel was first developed in the third and fourth centuries, everyone, and I mean everyone, believed in predestination. That's the way God did things. He decides who's saved. He decides who's lost. He's sovereign. You will not override God's decision. And so everyone believed in predestination. It's very strange that while predestination dropped out of the thinking of most Christians, 
the gospel built on predestination is still the major Christian gospel. After all, sin is our nature. We can't help it. We were born that way. Jesus Christ, he was sinless because he had a different nature. We are forgiven for all this bad sin in us, and at the second coming, God will push a magic button in our brains and we will never sin again. It's all pretty cut and dried. Bad equipment, sin. Good equipment, no sin. Wait for the good equipment, and then everything will be fixed. I think I'll get your agreement of what I'm going to say next. We're going to go to the other tree, and at the bottom of the other tree is a simple word called free choice. We've already heard about free choice. Free choice can determine our genetic inheritance. Wow, that is a mind blower. Free choice, not predestination, is the way God deals with human beings. So we're going to take a quick little trip up this tree. We're going to deal with the same subject, sin. In this gospel, sin is not an accident of birth. Sin is not having bad equipment. Sin is when you know the difference between right and wrong and you deliberately say, I'm going to do it the way I want to. Then you become a sinner in the sight of God. When you know the difference and deliberately choose what is wrong, then you become a sinner in God's sight. That means also that Jesus Christ, when he comes down to this earth, can take our fallen nature and not be automatically condemned as a sinner because sin is a choice it's not equipment and that means very simply bottom line that Jesus Christ can be tempted in all points like as we are he's not tempted three times in his life he's tempted constantly he's tempted from within he's tempted from without he is tempted on all of the same things that we are tempted on, and I mean all, and he has to make a choice every day of his life. That's what this teaching is saying. Coming up to the next point, justification. Now please notice, and sanctification. In this gospel, those two are equally important. There's not one that is more important than the other. Why is that? Let me try to illustrate. Let's say you listen to a person who has a marvelous testimony in church one Sabbath day. This person is praising God for the, the knowledge of forgiven sins, the victories he has had. He loves to study the Bible. He loves to pray. He has had so many good things happen to him since he accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, and he is so delighted to be able to share this testimony. You are impressed. You say, I want to find out a little more because I'd like to have that experience. So you follow him home from church one Sabbath afternoon to get better acquainted. And you notice a very strange thing. As he steps out of the car, the first thing you hear is a loud voice yelling at his kids. They must have really ticked him off on the way home, I guess. And as they walk up the driveway, it, the voice gets louder and his wife steps in to kind of blunt the force of his anger, and she gets his anger as well. And by the time they get to the front door, he's actually shoved his wife. Are you less impressed now than you were that Sabbath morning in church? Is something not quite right about that marvelous experience of forgiveness, justification? Is sanctification not quite measuring up? All right, let's turn it all around. Sanctification. A person in church that you know very well, very careful Sabbath keeper, would not do anything out of harmony with God's will on the Sabbath day. Very careful tithe payer. Very careful health reformer. Doing everything that you know of that to be the highest level of Seventh-day Adventist teaching. But whenever you talk to that person, there is no joy, there is no happiness, there is no peace. He hangs his head. And he says, I've got to do all these things because if I don't do them, sure, I'm going to end up in hell. And I don't want to go there. So I'm going to grit my teeth and I'm going to keep the Sabbath and I'm going to do all the other things no matter how much I don't like doing it. Is there something wrong with that experience? 
Sanctification looks good on the outside, doesn't it? But inside, where's the justification? Where's the forgiveness? Where's the joy of Jesus Christ living within the hope of glory? So what I'm simply saying is those two have to be in perfect balance. Justification and sanctification. Working together, complementing each other, being part of the same act of God's grace. Now, to make it very, very clear now, if you forget everything else I've said for this hour, listen carefully to what I'm going to say next. The major difference between the two Gospels is in this area right here. Let me reread the first Gospel to you. First Gospel now. Justification is 100% Christ's own perfect work done for us. Sanctification follows 50-50 as a cooperative work, I work and God works. 50-50. In the first gospel, only justification is 100% Christ's work. Sanctification is only half Christ's work. Therefore, it cannot be part of how God saves us. Let's look at that just a minute. Is justification 100% Christ's work? What do you think? Okay, I agree with you. You're absolutely right. But are there some things that you must do, believe, in order to participate in this 100% work of Christ? All right, let's be very simple and very basic. Do you have to believe that in those 66 books that we call the Bible, they are not just stories and interesting tales, but they are inspired words from God to us? Do you have to believe that? Okay, that's a big step right there, isn't it? Do you have to believe that tucked away about two-thirds of the way in that book is a story of someone who came down from heaven to live beginning as a baby on this earth, lived a life without sinning for over 30 years, and then died on a cross as a criminal, and that death will give you eternal life if you accept it? Do you have to believe that? Talk about a big step of faith. To believe that that will get you salvation and eternal life? Well, once you do that, then do you have to make some decisions about your own life? Do you have to do something called repent of your past way of living? Which means turn around, by the way, doesn't it? Do you have to, if you've wronged another individual, do you have to go to that individual and confess personally and humbly to that individual for what you have done? That's not easy, is it? Do you have to surrender your life totally to God's control? Okay, let's say you do all those things. You believe the Bible, you believe in Jesus Christ, you repent, you confess, and you surrender. And let's say just for a moment that Jesus Christ never did die on a cross 2,000 years ago, that that's a made-up story. How far will all that get you? Zero. Zero. No matter how much you pray, no matter how much you believe, if it didn't happen, we were all wasting our time. Is that correct? That means that justification is 100% Christ's work, doesn't it? Because you're not going to be saved by praying or repenting. You're going to be saved by what Christ did for you on a cross and his resurrection. Here's something that we've got to keep carefully distinct in our minds or we will never understand the gospel. There is a cause of salvation. That's Jesus Christ's death on the cross. And there are conditions to salvation. The other gospel doesn't like to hear about conditions. Oh, that's too negative. That's too legalistic. Conditions. There are conditions. The conditions, believe in the Bible, believe in Jesus Christ, repent of your sins, confess your sins, surrender your life, and those conditions move you over to where Jesus forgives your sins. Conditions and cause must go together in the salvation process. But Jesus' death is the only cause of salvation. All right. Sanctification. That's where the rub lies. Sanctification. Is it 50% or 100% Christ's work? God's work. Let's take Sabbath keeping as an example. Let's say you're very careful in keeping the Sabbath. You set aside all business before sundown. You make sure that the Friday afternoon activities are completed. 
You spend Friday evening in a, in a restful, peaceful worship of the Lord. Sabbath morning, you go to church. Sabbath afternoon, you participate in more than lay activities. You do some things that are helpful for your friends, for your community, for your own personal growth. And then you close the Sabbath at sundown with worship. Does that make you a Sabbath keeper? I'm going to say no, not even close. What it does is make you a Saturday keeper. You're keeping the seventh day of the week very carefully. Who are the best Saturday keepers this world has ever known? Ah, the Pharisees, weren't they? They had every jot and tittle cross. They knew exactly what was allowable and what was not allowable on the Sabbath, and they were precisely uh, careful in how they made things legal or illegal. Jesus had to spend most of his ministry, are you aware, trying to turn Saturday keepers into Sabbath keepers. Wow. Some people, some other Christians, misidentify us as Seventh-day Adventists. They call us Seven-Day Adventists. Have you heard that? Seven-Day Adventists. They may be more right than we want to admit. Folks, if we aren't a Seventh-day Adventist Christian on Tuesday, forget about the Seventh-day Sabbath. It's not going to happen, not Sabbath. Maybe Saturday, but not Sabbath. If we are not 100% filled with the Holy Spirit during the six days of the week, we will never, ever begin to keep a sacred holy day at the end of the week. Because only a holy person can keep a holy day. Who makes a person holy? Shutting down your business on Sabbath, on Friday evening, does that make you holy? Coming to church on Sabbath morning, does that make you holy? The only way that you can become a holy person, a saint, as Paul describes it in the New Testament, is by the power, the miracle-working power of the Holy Spirit, working in you from the inside out, changing you, making you different than you were. And only a spirit-empowered holy person can keep a spirit-directed holy Sabbath day. So I'm going to say to you that I don't believe that, sa that sanctification is 50% God's work. I believe it's 100% God's work. And that's the difference between these two Gospels. The big difference. Is sanctification essential to salvation or a byproduct of salvation? That is the difference. And so right here, if sanctification is 100% God's work, yes, there are conditions. Sure, there are conditions. Setting aside your business, coming to church, those are conditions. None of those make you a Sabbath keeper. Only the Holy Spirit can make you a Sabbath keeper. So if justification is 100% Christ's work and sanctification is 100% Christ's work, then is it just possible that perfection may be a gift of God as well, 100% his work? Is that possible, that it's not just something that you have to grit your teeth and try harder for, but is as just as much a gift of God as his forgiveness, that he can do for you a miracle that, cannot, that can hardly be imagined? I'm going to share with you in a little illustration that may be of some help. God works like an infinitely skillful physician. He can save and heal anyone who trusts him. He is not at all satisfied when we come to his office just to be forgiven. He proposes to, the to bring us to the place where we won't have to ask for forgiveness anymore. He offers to heal that place where people do their thinking. Then they won't violate those rules anymore because they don't even want to, and all the bad habits are gone. To some, that sounds ominously like perfection. Servants see this as a command. Friends see it as a promise. Friends don't want God to settle for anything less. Would you ask a physician not to heal you completely? Would you say 75% healing will be quite sufficient, thank you? To servants who think of salvation as dealing with their legal problems, perfection is yet another requirement. To friends who think of salvation as healing the damage sin has done, perfection is an incredibly generous offer. Servants want to be completely forgiven. Friends want to be completely 
heal. About that matter of perfection, the heavenly physician might call after us as we walk away from his office. Don't worry about it. I've so designed my universe that it's a law. People become like the person they worship and admire. If you really stay my trusting friends, perfection will come. I'm not saying you won't struggle anymore, but the struggle won't be the same. My friends, if there's any hope of this perfection thing, it's got to be something like that. God healing the damage sin has done. Well, there you have the gospel expressed from a different perspective. Two gospels. The first gospel can be summarized by the word forgiveness. If you're forgiven, you're saved. End of discussion. This gospel. Here's a statement that I came across. We can summarize the gospel with one word. What do you think that word is going to be? Restoration, restoration. This emphasis makes Seventh-day Adventist theology unique. Ah, I think that's it, my friends. That's what you'll not hear on those Sunday morning telecasts. Restoration, sanctification, restoring the image of Christ, making you whole again, healing you completely. That's Adventism. And that's what makes it worthwhile to have a church right here. That's why we should help others to find that healing in their lives. Not just a quick fix, God forgives you and you're saved, but the change that takes place down deep. Marrying strange theology with Adventist theology can justifiably be described as patchwork theology. And I'm afraid we've been patching it together. For 30 to 40 years in the Seventh-day Adventist church, not realizing its impact on our doctrines and our lifestyle. Well, what results does this gospel have in these uh, fruits of the tree? Is a judgment important in this gospel? Is a judgment necessary to see whether that person sitting in a church pew is really working on God's plan in harmony with his will and would be happy in heaven or not? Boy, a judgment is so crucial to get all the, ta- all the cards on the table, to find out what a person really wants, what a re- person really believes, and all the rest. How about Ellen G. White now and the spirit of prophecy? I came across this from Dwight Nelson. Some of you have heard him on net programs here and there. If you've been in the Seventh-day Adventist church very long at all, you've been tempted to not believe in this prophet stuff. In today's religious environment, it's embarrassing to be different. It's embarrassing to have a prophet in your movement. You're considered a bit odd, a little strange. And so we have gone quiet about Ellen White. Without any fanfare or apology, we've simply gone silent. Don't quote her from the pulpit, we admonish each other. Just read the word. Didn't she give some counsel to that effect? But the time has come this close to the end of earth civilization, to re-examine, reflect, re-study, and recommit ourselves to the mission and message of that woman, the most prolific female author in the history of the human race. It's time to stop apologizing for her ministry, both in our own movement and outside of it. It's a little different from that letter I read earlier, isn't it? Yet both are Seventh-day Adventists. We have to decide if we really believe that there is value in this gift for us. Now, he was doing so well, and I liked what he was saying so much, and then he just uh, stomped on all of our toes. He said, we shouldn't call these the red books. They're really the unread books. Oh, dear. You know, it doesn't make much difference, does it, if you have a little bonfire ceremony out in your backyard and burn all the Ellen White books, or... If you have every one of the books she has ever written in your library in pristine condition because they never get touched, does it make much difference? Are we reading them, my friends, and are we growing through them? The law, the Ten Commandments. We've got a problem here. I don't know if I'd get any volunteers if I asked for someone to raise their hand as being willing to let me follow you home with a video camera 
and videotape everything you say and do that's of significance for the next 30 days and then bring you back up in front of this congregation and say, here is living proof that a human being can keep the law perfectly for 30 days. I don't think I'd get many takers. So how can we say that the law can be kept by someone with a fallen nature if we're not willing to be exhibit A? We are not the ones who have done that or feel confident that we can do that. We say the law can be kept, but where's the evidence? Where's the evidence that anyone with a fallen nature can possibly keep God's law perfectly? Where is it? Ah, it is Jesus Christ, isn't it? But please notice, it's only if he took a fallen nature. Because if he didn't take a fallen nature, then no one has proved that can be done not in the history of this earth. And Satan's argument still is valid. You can't keep the law if you've got a fallen nature. It's very important, these issues. The Sabbath, you know all the Sabbath is? It's the flagship of the law. People can't tell if you're coveting. They can, cont they can tell if you're keeping the Sabbath. It's the flag that you hold up saying, I love God's law. I love all of it. Up to the top of the tree, those... Uh, ticklish areas, much discussion on those areas. Health. Well, if you're a vegetarian, that must give you a pretty good shot for salvation, right? Oh, mu much better if you're a vegan. Then you've got to tick it in. Right? Or dead wrong. You know what health reform is all about. Let's say you found a person on your, on your, in your street who's really having a problem, physically and mentally, and this person is not doing well at all, you take pity on him, and you make him an offer. This is a big offer. If you are willing to change your ways and follow everything that I tell you to do and not deviate in the slightest, I will bring you into my own home and take care of you for 30 days. I will feed you, I will help you, I will take you in under my wing, and we'll get things turned around. He's so desperate, he takes you up on it. And he does listen, and he does follow everything that you tell him to do. And I mean everything. And you know what? As we just alluded to a little bit earlier, the statistics are that there are a few extra years for you if you follow this lifestyle. That you'll live longer than the average pop person. He does it. He lives his extra seven years. He dies of natural causes. And he wakes up in the wrong resurrection. You know, the one at the end of the millennium. Have we done him any good? We gave him extra years. He didn't get a heart attack, cancer. Isn't that what health reform is all about? Or is it not what health reform is about at all? Bottom line, health reform is because the body and the mind are one unit. Isn't that right? And what affects one affects the other, and it goes both ways. Have you noticed? So the reason for health reform is because if the body is being fed nutrients that starve it or pollute it, then where is that blood eventually going to end up? Through the brain, circulating through the brain. And if polluted blood is circulating through the brain and feeding those brain cells, what do you think our decisions are going to be? Well-informed or poor judgments? And where does God do his saving work? Not in my finger, not in my heart, even though we use the term heart, but in my brain. That's where he does his saving work. So the very simple reason for health reform is to get the body cleaned up so the mind can think clearly and God has a fighting chance to save our souls. Health reform is important. How about standards of the church? Now I'm talking about all of them now. Remember all of the standards that we hold in the Seventh-day Adventist church. Let's say you listen to your pastor and do what your pastor says 75% of the time. And then you listen to your favorite TV personality and do what he or she says the other 25% of the time. Who's going to win that little tug of war? I think your pastor has got the short end of the stick. Because we got this fallen nature, remember? Is Satan a good communicator? Does he know how to get through to where we live? 
Does he know how to bypass the frontal lobes of the brain to get right down to the emotions and get us to make decisions based on that? Is God a good communicator through the Holy Spirit? So we've got two master communicators, do we not? Each trying to persuade us of the rightness of their ways. You know what standards are all about? I mean all of them. Shutting down avenues by which Satan can talk to us. Shutting down channels of communication that Satan uses with great effect. You're not watching that, you're not reading that, you're not listening to that. Satan can't talk to you then on those levels. When those are shut down, does that not open up more avenues by which God can speak to us? And does that not give God a better fighting chance to save our souls? So are standards important? Are they just a matter of being having your name on the church books? Or is it way different than that? It is allowing God to do his saving work in an effective way. So they become vitally important in this gospel. Well, there you have my perspective on what these two gospels are all about. I came across this well-said statement. It is, sad, it is sad to see the illusion popularized that such lifestyle issues as diet and adornment come from a, quote, religious perspective, but are, quote, not a matter of salvation. In the, if the written word of God addresses a subject, it must be salvation related or God would have left it alone. That's good advice. If the written counsel of God addresses a subject, it must have some relationship to our salvation. Not, might not be a cause, might be a condition, but it has some effect on our salvation and we can't ignore it. And so I think that's vitally important. All right, we have looked at two Gospels. Now, please remember, up to this point, I haven't given you any evidence on which to base your faith. I've only given you definitions and my convictions. And I'm going to say something very important that I want you to hear right now. Do not believe what I have said this afternoon because you heard me say it. Because if that's the reason you do it, you will hear someone else say exactly the opposite a month from now, six months from now, and you will say, that sounds good too. If you're going to believe what I'm sharing with you this afternoon, I want you to believe it because you have studied it for yourself, not because you came to a meeting. Because you have thoroughly gone over the material that we're going to cover. And obviously I haven't done any of that yet. So we'll start with that in our next meeting. And then we're going to continue it tomorrow morning. But we will cover the reasons that I believe this is the correct gospel. And then I'm going to ask you to make a decision about what you believe. It is a life or death decision, folks. Because again, in my judgment, this gospel is the gospel of the Bible. And I'm going to try to show that. And the other gospel is Satan's best counterfeit that he has ever devised in all of religion. Sabbath is not even close to this because you can figure that out by just going up to a calendar. But that other gospel sounds so right. It has so many persuasive points to it. And I believe this is the best counterfeit he has ever devised, and maybe this is the one in which even the very elect could be deceived. While they will never give up the Sabbath, and they may even be good health reformers, but if they're following a gospel devised and originated in the mind of Satan, eternal life is gone. And so this is a very important issue. And I think there are very important consequences to this as well. I want to finish up, and by the way, this is my longer presentation. The next one will be a shorter presentation, so we'll get back on schedule, and the time will be, work, will work, that be uh, we'll work it out. Back in 1973, the front cover of the Adventist Review said, World Leaders in Annual Council Speak to the Church. Now, what, were, what was the burden of the leaders of the Seventh-day Adventist Church in that year, 1973? I'm going to read you one paragraph from this three-page article. When a generation of Seventh-day Adventists is truly serious about becoming exhibits of what God's grace can do, the moment of final decision by the whole world for or against God will not be long delayed. 
Now that's an interesting sentence. When a generation of Adventists get serious about what the gospel can do and be exhibits of that, the moment of final decision will not be long delayed. Well, what about getting the gospel to the whole world? I thought that was the predecessor to the second coming of Christ. In this three pages, there's not one word about how many souls we're winning, how many evangelistic uh, meetings we're holding, just that sentence. And the whole article is based on that sentence. The editor of the review at that time thought it might be worthwhile to explain a little bit, and in his next editorial he said, this appeal built on three presuppositions. Number one, Christ could have come decades ago. Number two, the blame for the delay rests with man, not God. Number three, the delay will continue until God has a people who through the faith of Jesus develop the character of Jesus and thus forever refute Satan's charge that God was unjust in asking man to obey his law perfectly. The delay will continue until God has that people built by that gospel and then he added, but if leaders and people are unconcerned about what God is attempting, if they are content to stay in this world, if they are satisfied with business as usual, then as the president of the General Conference pointed out at the recent annual council, 1973 may be known as the 1888 of our generation. Now the president of that year was Elder Robert Pearson. What did he mean by that? What was he afraid of? Well, listen, 1888 is very simple. Bottom line, God came to his people. That's my great-grandfather's generation, by the way. He was a delegate to that council in Minneapolis. He came to that generation of Seventh-day Adventists, and he said, I am ready to finish things up. We do not have to go into the next century, World War I, World War II, terrorism, and all of the things that you and I have become very familiar with don't have to happen. We can finish it here and now. And what did we say back to God? Well, this wasn't approved by the right committees. Uh, this, uh, this message was brought to us by a couple of young upstarts from California that are trying to just kind of break down the, the landmarks of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. This can't be good. This didn't get the right approval from the right sources. Uh, we can't go along with that. That's dangerous. And the message of righteousness by faith was trampled on, ignored, and ridiculed 120 years ago. That's what Elder Pearson was afraid of, that we could do it all over again. Now, 1973 is quite a ways back, too, isn't it? Some of you weren't even born in that year. And so years have gone by, decades have gone by since that time. And here we are still talking about Jesus coming soon. We still sing about it, we pray about it, we hope for it. And we even hope that maybe, maybe if we can get the gospel to the 1040 window and do it with power, that'll solve the problem. Well, I'm going to suggest to you that the issue of getting the gospel to the world and seeing Christ come in our lifetime is based on one thing. Because there will not be the gospel going to the entire world without something else preceding it. It's called the latter reign of the Holy Spirit. See, there are four things that have to happen in order. You can't change the order. Latter reign, power of the Holy Spirit. Loud cry to the world, the message going to the entire world. Close of human probation. Second coming of Christ. That order cannot be changed. So if that is the key factor, the latter rain, then how am I to make my heart ready for that experience? And you know what I'm going to suggest? Don't worry about the latter rain. Don't agonize over the latter rain. Why isn't it here? It's got to be here. I want it now. Focus on the former rain. That's the former rain, the gospel, the transforming power of Jesus Christ, his forgiveness, his sanctifying power. That's the former rain. If the former rain is doing its work, the latter rain will follow just as surely as it did in Old Testament times. The latter rain cannot help but come if the gospel is taking hold of us from the inside out and changing us from our roots to our fruits. So I'm going to say focus on the gospel, the former rain, 
and then pray for the latter rain because it will come. It can't be delayed. It won't be 50 years from now. It can come right now. And then last day events will be quick and sure. And this generation won't have to turn it over to the next generation. I'd like that, my friends. We have turned it over to too many generations. Too many years have gone by, too many experiences, and we need to end the process. That's what we're here to talk about. How can we end this process? How can we be the generation that sees the final events of world's history and sees Jesus come in the clouds of heaven and say, we are grateful that he has saved us.